So welcome along again uh, to In Conservation With and tonight, this morning, this afternoon, I am in the company, virtually at least, with Sarah Gibson, who has written this book, Swifts and Us. And you can see in the back of her wall there, poster of it as well. And tonight, by the way, has been sponsored by Leica Sport Optics. So thank you very much. So Sarah, um, the first question I need to ask you is, how are you and where in the world are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm in Shropshire. Um, but I have to say, on I had a few days away in Dorset at the end of last week, beginning of this week, and I saw my first Swift uh, on Monday, just coming off the sea, um, obviously not landing, but flying over Stone Barrow Hill near Charmouth. So that was a wonderful moment for me. I haven't seen them back home yet. Fantastic. I, I was seeing the first Alpine Swift on March the 1st in, in the, uh, Extra Majuda. The first common swift I noted about three weeks ago and the first pallid swift. I mean, last year before the COVID thing, I was in Spain, actually, and I saw pallid swift on Jan in January. Um, but pallid swift this year, um, I actually saw in March. And there's one other swift in my region to turn up, which is the white rump swift, mm. which um, is to be seen in Montfragway. Um, and other sort of mountainous areas within Extra Madura, but certainly elsewhere in southern Spain. And uh, they show up in May. So uh, I'll be uh, looking forward to seeing them as well. Um, now, many people may not know of you, Sarah. So I just wondered if you could uh, do us the pleasure of telling us about yourself a little bit, you know, in terms of where did your interest in nature dawn, or when did it dawn? and uh, what led you to be sitting in front of us tonight? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I grew up in a village, a rural village in Sussex. Um, and I, I wouldn't say I've an awful lot of people who end up writing books or doing the th kind of things that you're doing, David, have been obsessed with birds since they were born, practically. Um, I wasn't one of those. I absorbed a lot about nature as I went along, but perhaps in a more general way. Um, and conservation, I was very, I was tuned into conservation at a fairly early age because I grew up in the 70s and there was, there was a lot of destruction of hedgerows and things going on then. So that was my awakening. Um, and I've, I've worked for Shropshire Wildlife Trust for 20 years so there again i've been absorbing a lot about all different kinds of nature and the threats that it faces and potential solutions as well um so that's re I, and i I've, I've been on the comm side producing the magazine that sort of thing so i've been writing for a long time but i really never thought i'd write a book until um 2000 probably early 2014 I would say I'd had a year off ill um, and my energy was shot and I did go back lovely Shropshire Wildlife Trust kept my job open for me and um, I did go back but part-time and I thought well is that really kind of the end of all I'm ever going to achieve in my life and I just thought maybe I might have limited energies but maybe I could do something else and um, that was that was in a way how uh, it came to me very quickly that I wanted to write a book about Swifts because I'd been um, watching them a lot since moving into a town a couple of years previously. Um, they, they and I'd become aware also of the problems they face, faced and also the inspirational grassroots movement trying to do things to help them. So all those things combined. And as soon as I thought of writing it, I never looked back and it's just been the most wonderful journey um, of discovery. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great story. Before we actually talk about Swifts, I'm really, you know, I'm always, um, the Zoomers uh, are regular will, will know this. I'm very interested in, in people's writing processes because there's, I know there's people in the audience who 
you know, maybe harboring thoughts of writing themselves. And I think you touched on something that was quite interesting because, you know, this is your first book, but you said you, you've been writing a lot before, which is true because, you know, you've been in stuff in, in comms um, yeah. for the Shropshire Wildlife, Wildlife Trust. And I think myself, I, I, I've always thought to myself and I've always said to other people who want to start writing that, you know, you practice by writing tweets or text message, you know, because you're telling a story in 180 characters or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, how did you approach it in terms of this? Did you did you think about it in those terms? I or think, just... sorry, um, very much the storytelling mode. Yes, I would go for that. And I also think, you know, the experience, I might not have done a book, but I've done, I suppose it's the old 10,000 hours develop to develop a skill thing it, it just practice not not even thinking about a book but just generally writing that's absolutely helped develop my my whatever craft skill whatever um and yeah stories and uh i do i, I do a lot of editing as well as writing because we get pieces in for the magazine and i'm quite a harsh editor um, and I, I'm always trying to hone things back, make them a bit more spare. And that is part of it, telling the story, really. So you, you get down to the essentials and the bits that really, um, really engage with people. That, that's what I'm trying to do. I, I, I really don't want them to get bored. Yeah. I mean, I, I, in the beginning of your book, because often the, the beginning is what obviously draws you in and you're very descriptive in terms of you, you know, going around the village um, with the Ninja Swift and the people you meet and the sorts of people they were. It's not just the name of a person, it's actually what they did and how they appeared to you and their demeanour, which I think is a really, really nice way of not only introducing the subject, but getting people to to be involved in the world as well at the same time. Yeah. So that was that was really quite nice. You did talk about something in the beginning of your book, by the way. Are you going to be talking about it in your presentation, or can I ask that question now? Ask it now. Okay. <laughs> this is a question I've been burning to ask all night, Zoomers. How, when you pick up a Swift, should you be dealing with it to get it back into the air? Because we've been told so many times to throw them up in the air, how how do you actually get them aloft again? What's well, the proper way? If you do find a ground, grounded swift, that is abs absolutely the last thing you should do, which is something I found out as well. Um, yes, it's 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 one of those things that everyone says that you throw them in the air and they'll be off. Well, what that fails to take into account is that your swift that you've just found might have fallen. 50 or 100 feet it it's it's had a shock it might have had an injury you don't know um but it, the, the, to throw it straight in the air is really not a good idea um the first thing you should do um is move it obviously because it's very vulnerable to a cat or other predators um but put it somewhere quiet and dark and let it, it may be that if you give it a chance to gently and slowly recover, that it will. If there's, if there's no actual bone broken or other injury, that may be all it needs. Um, and then the thing to do is at dusk, well, sort of, you want to go out on a, when it's not raining, when the conditions are, are, are okay for a swift, when it's easy weather, um, and take it somewhere, perhaps on a hill, but not throw it out of a window. Just hold it aloft in your hands like this. And if it's ready to go, it will. You can gently do a little bit of that to get the wind under its wings, but don't throw it. Um, and if, if, if it doesn't want to fly, you, you, your best bet is to take it to a swift carer. Well, if you look on Swift Conservation website, there are contact details, I think, for for finding your nearest one or the RSPCA. Um, but you do want to find one that's a specialist swift carer so that you know it's going to get the right diet. 
um, because swifts are insectivorous and um, not all wildlife rescue centres will feed them an insectivorous diet but that is if you if you would just want to give them the diet they would have in the air and that's absolutely the best thing to do yeah um here in spain in extremadura um, there's an animal wildlife um there's an animal hospital basically um only one in an area the size of wales which is incredible and it's underfunded it's not even funded by the government so but anyway, um, last a few years ago, I went there and um, they had several swifts that have been sort of found fallen from their nests. And they had a great way of sort of rearing them in that they meticulously fed them day and night. And then they had this run, they built this kind of long run and they'll just let the swifts go and they'll fly up and down this run and um, get themselves fit. And yeah. I was able to be um, present and actually able to hold a swift and let it go, you know, after they thought it's been rehabilitated enough. And that was quite a, an amazing moment because, you know, you've got this bird trembling in your hands yeah. and then you hold it up and then it, it just flies off and then it's gone. And then you'll be telling us where they go. But I mean, it's just incredible how they, they move. It's just uh, it's amazing creatures. I think at this point, maybe, um, Maybe we can sort of, if you can tell us more about Swifts in your presentation. And whilst you're pressing buttons, I just want to uh, say that uh, in the chat, Claire Evans has saw, have seen her first Swift of the year today. Um, so it was heading north. Uh, Sean Moore had his, in fact, he had 100 feeding of Staines Reservoir, which is a great, always a great site. Dennis over there in eastern north america has had no chimney swifts yet i wonder if they're late dennis i don't know when they are supposed to be showing up around your way but anyway um sarah i will pass it over to you for short for the time being thank you so the first thing i think we should do is listen to some swifts That is just the most beautiful sound. Um, and then when you're a beginner birder or when you're just starting to look out and try and work out what's in your garden, what's about, it can be quite difficult to know the difference between the various aerial migrants that come our way and people do muddle them up a lot, the swift, the house martin the, and the swallow. In fact, when you look at them like this as a photo, you can see they're all completely different. Um, and the, the swallow, lots of blue, red, red, rusty red face, and the house martin, um, a, lot, a lot more white, shorter tail than the swallow that's got long streamers. The swift, as you can see, is um, nearly, when you see them up in the sky they look black but in fact they're very dark brown um almost all over they do have and you'll see in some of the photos coming up they do have a bit of a white chin um but mostly very dark brown with these long much bigger than swallows and martins very long swept back wings um, and in fact the other thing is that a lot of people think that they're all in the same family and this was believed for hundreds of years that they were all related to each other in fact they're not house martins and swallows are in the same family but swifts are not so who are they related to well could it be us if you look at this um, drawing of the swift's wing bones and you look at the drawing of the human arm they're quite similar um, so clearly at some point we must be related but in fact there are something like 600 million years of evolutionary time between us so we're related but not closely however if you um, were to explore fossils as some wonderful paleontologists have done you would find that the nearest relative to the swift is actually the hummingbird and the evidence for it for this is it the, the the, the main anatomical feature that they both share is this humerus, this bone here, this stocky bone, which is 
the same in both both this swift fossil here and it's hummingbirds have it and swifts have it and it enables the hummingbird to flap its wings incredibly fast something like oh how many of them I'm trying to remember how many, 50 beats per second, that's what it is. A hummingbird can flap its wings 50 times in, a, in one second. Swift obviously doesn't do that, but it, um, it has to have very strong, a very strong skeleton for the, for the aerial life it leads, in, always on the wing, um, always roaming about. So this bone here, which was found in a, 50 million year old fossil in America, um, along with all sorts of other amazing fossils, things like, I think they found the earliest, earliest ever bat fossil, and not just the bat, but they could see what the bat had eaten in its last ever meal, so the insects inside its stomach had survived in fossilised form, um, all sorts of things wonderful um, array of insects and you can see this is 50 million years old but when when they looked at this fossil they could even see the melanin in the feathering they could see that it was black and this one had a bit of a crest um, which is more like some of the tree swifts are today so very very early kind of a swift pre-swift pre-hummingbird and this one over here was a several million years later 47 million years ago and this one was found in germany and as you can see this one really looks like our common swift here with its long wings long swept back wings a beautiful one again that was found in an old quarry um where i think there'd been volcanic gases that had escaped through a lake and again hundreds of bat fossils were found and nine pairs of mating turtles who all died at this moment when the poisonous gases burst through the lake and various pygmy horses and giant mice um, but yes this swift among them so the swift's latin name apus apus which means without feet and this is what aristotle called it and Linnaeus subsequently several hundred years later gave it its Latin binomial binomial apus apus so as you can see here swifts very clearly do have feet um, with these incredibly strong hooked claws um, which they use obviously swifts are in the air for nearly all their lives from the moment they fledge out of the nest until they come back to a nest um, to claim their own nest the following year or um, to breed a few years later they'll be on the wing all the time unless something happens like this where there's been very cold weather and um, the swifts have settled in the corner of this building for warmth gathering like a feather boa and using their hooked claws to hold themselves vertically on the wall and the other thing they also use them for is fighting um, you do get swift fights where there where there's a conflict over a nest hole um, they will lock their feet um, lock their opponent lock their opponent's feet and try and push one out of the nest hole and these fights can go on for hours um, so and also they do when you see a webcam with swifts in it and you see them shuffling about they look so ungainly but there again they have so very little use for their feet they're they're good enough for what they need them to do and most of the time they're tucked up well into their bodies so that you don't see them so they do look without feet so one of the first people to study the swifts was gilbert white in the natural history of selborne and you can see him here doing something a bit unwise. He appears to be poking at an adder, um, but maybe he's just keeping far enough away so it doesn't actually bite him. Um, Gilbert White, as many of you know, was an excellent naturalist, um, the vicar of 
Selborne in Hampshire and he had a lot of time on his hands to explore nature and he recorded the dates when birds returned, the dates when they left. Um, he, were, he was particularly interested in swifts and, and looked into their nesting habits um, and found them nesting in an old quarry and in the thatched cottages of the villages nearby. Um, and I think he noticed that sometimes people would beat, them, beat their nest down. People were, um, there were always been good people and bad people and people who saw swifts as devils and didn't want them there. But he did observe their behaviour. He was one of the first people to really um, remark on their behaviour and how they, um, he, 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 he witnessed them mating in the air and he wrote a little description of that. Um, so he, 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 he also had this theory that, or he explored the theory of hibernation um, which was perhaps there was a long, long story of swifts that were potentially nesting at the bottom and swallows and martins nesting at the bottom of lakes. And he did get a bit, he waded into that one a bit and he couldn't quite bring himself to reject it. He knew that migration happened, but he also thought it just seemed like common sense that little tiny birds that fledged at the end of the season should actually not have the strength to make it back to wherever they were going down south africa or wherever um and he did he never quite could bring himself to reject the idea of bird hibernation but lots and lots of interesting observations but this is the man david lack who wrote a book in the 1950s um following a study in the tower in Oxford, the museum tower. Um, and he again was a, a pioneering scientist. He, he believed in watching the birds in their natural environment. An awful lot of science up until then had been about looking at dead birds and, they, and working back from there rather than actually observing. So he set up his um, he'd already written a book called The Life of the Robin, um, which was a very famous one at the time, and he, he'd, he'd, he'd done all his studies, well, in an early job as a school teacher at a progressive school in Devon, where um, it was very progressive, so the children didn't even have to attend classes, so I think he had a lot of time on his hands. And um, he, he studied the robins in the school grounds, and ended up finding an awful lot about how territorial they are um, and how, how quite aggressive they are as well. But it, after, then, he was, then the war came along, the Second World War. He was in radar development and as well as tracking enemy aircraft, he was also watching birds, tracking migration on radar. And then after the war, he came to Oxford and set up the Great Tit Survey at Witham Woods. And then he wanted something else to do and he decided swifts hadn't been that well studied so but then he wanted to find somewhere he could do this because the one the one thing you can watch in with a swift is when they're nesting that's the one chance you get to get closer to them um and he got the idea of um installing swift of installing nest bricks nest boxes in this tower behind the ventilation flutes. Um, he got the idea from a Swiss a schoolmaster called Emil Weitnauer, who'd done the same thing. And so he did, and he spent years in this tower, in this little dark tower in the summer, watching the Swifts along with his field assistant, who was called Elizabeth. And she, in fact, Elizabeth Silver, she was one of the first people to uh, record and take notes of a swift fight and she watched one for four and a half hours it's a real feat of endurance that swift fight um, but anyway the happy ending there was that David and and, and Elizabeth got married um, and he read the book and she continued going up the 
30 foot wobbly ladder into the tower until one week before her first child was born. So she was pretty devoted and determined as well. So he, this is a wonderful book. It's, it's the gold standard on Swifts that we've all been reading for years, except I couldn't get a copy of this for love nor money um, for less than 80 pounds, which is another reason why I thought, I think maybe I better write a book about Swift so it's a bit more available. Um, and the other one here, Devil Birds, The Life of the Swift. This was, uh, Derek Brummel produced a film by that name, um, a short half an hour film about Swifts based very much on the book, in filming in the tower, and it's delightful. Um, if you get a chance to see it, which you could do if you sponsor a Swift with North Wales Wildlife Trust, um, if you sponsor a Swift box, they will send you a copy of the DVD of that film, which is worth having. It's a lovely little half an hour. So, other people who've been interested in Swifts, we have this chap here, um, Lazzaro Spallanzani, Italian uh, priest and scientist, more particularly a scientist. Um, he was amazingly interested. I suppose in those days you didn't you didn't have to study just one thing. You could be you could study a range of things, and he did microbes, frogs. He was um, the first person to carry out in vitro fertilization, and he did that with a frog. But he was also fascinated by swifts and um, he did things like tie red thread around their legs to see if they'd come back to the same nest site and he proved that they would and they did um, and he also did experiments to measure how far um, how far away they could they could hone in on their prey and i think he got it he did an experiment worked out at 314 feet they could accurately see um, a little flying ant. This is Emil Weitnau, the person I mentioned before who put swift bo boxes on his house um, and he he wrote a lovely little book called Mein Vogel and he studied them for many many years and um, he was completely fascinated by them and he's still a bit of a legend out in Switzerland today and he did things like um, take to a hot air balloon and a little tiny light aircraft um, in order to prove that Swifts slept on the wing. So it's a lovely little story. And this is the guy, he's a Scottish aristocrat. Um, his brother was Alec Douglas Hume um, and who was Prime Minister at one point and he was a, he also loved Swifts and put up Swift boxes on his house in Scotland before David Lapp did and was observing them and he'd also watched them when he was at school. He was like lots of aristocrats, he went to Eton and he used to lean out of the window in the evening smoking a pipe and watching the Swifts and then when the schoolmasters came by he'd, he'd explain away the, the smell of the pipe smoke by saying it's the musty smell of Swifts, sir. So, but yeah, he became a good conservationist and a BBC broadcaster of on, on birds. It was a good chap. So here we have, um, this is Weitnau's little bird. He took, he, he ringed his birds like many people do. Um, and this one, he, there was a photograph taken on this Swift's 21st birthday. So that was a really, a really um, long lived bird. Um, and this one here is the only one, one this this is actually a drawing from a little French magazine called La Hulotte. Um, wonderful little natural history magazine produced by one guy who does all the research and the illustrations and the cartoons. And um, this Swift here that he drew um, was originally ringed near Orléans, Orléans um, in France in 1967. Um, on the 11th of June and then caught again 28 years in 11 months and 27 days later. So one hell of a long lived swift this one. And this Methuselah, I, I was, I, Methuselah, this is obviously goes back to 
um, the Bible person who was who was supposed to live to 969. Methuselah was Noah's grandfather. I thought you'd like to know that. So here's our swift back again with some wonderful photographs here um, by Piotr. I'm not going to try and pronounce his surname. I must learn it. Um, so the, these just show the amazing aerial abilities of the swift and how they can adapt their flight to twist and turn and fly for thousands. Flight is all they do. Flight is nothing special to a swift. That is its life. Um, the, the, it, and that is, it's like breathing. Flying is like breathing to a swift. And they can do so many things in flight. So they gather all their food in flight. You can just see there, I don't know if you can see the mouse, but there's a tiny insect there. You can also see this must be a swift gathering food for its young, because you can see the engorged throat. Um, because what they'll do is they'll catch 300, 1,000 insects at a time to take back to the young. And it all gets stuck together into a ball with their saliva. This one here, you can see it again, um, a big swelled up throat and those long swept back wings. And this one here is even more amazing. This is a swift preening in the air. So it's stretching back, its head's right back. It's, it's got its beak into its wing feathers and it's just having a scratch, or having an itch or removing a mite. But they can do all these things without losing balance. They're just, just so well adapted. And here they are, some drinking, gathering, scooping up some water from a lake. Um, and then as they rise from the water, they'll shiver the water droplets off their wings. And here they are doing just what Gilbert White said they would do, mating in the air. Um, a very difficult picture to get because it just lasts for a split second. And of course, sleeping on the wing. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'd love this little, a few words by Wilfred Owen. But when Eve shines lowly and the light is thinned and the mood slides slowly down the far off wind. Oh, then to be of all birds the swift. And there thou sleepest all the luminous night aloft this hurry and this hunger. Just a part of the poem. There's a lot more of it than that. So these are some of their nesting places. Um, they, they do like to go under gables. They'll go under the eaves here. They find a little dark hole under the eaves. They don't build a nest on the outside like a martin or, or, um, or a swallow. Um, or they might nest, they find little gaps in the pantiles. This is really good. I'm sure you'll know all about this, David, in the, especially in the Mediterranean countries, they, they tend to go a lot under the tiles. Um, this is an old workhouse near to where I live, which is, it hasn't, let's just say it hasn't been over renovated. It's also got open eaves, so there's a lot of access to swifts and it's one of the best places. There are probably about 30 pairs nesting here. Um, it's a it's a really wonderful place for them and this of course um, is what would have been and still is in some places the kind of place they nest naturally um, so this is a tree in Scotland where there are swifts and I did see swifts coming out of this tree um, but there's very few and far between in this country there are more of them um, in East Germany Corsica um, uh, there are Lapland, I believe, and, uh, and a few other places um, where, where you'll find them, the Czech Republic, I think. Um, but by and large, nearly all our common swifts now nest in buildings. And so this is what they do in their little dark hole. They lay two or three eggs, white because they show up they're easier to see in the dark. Um, and there they are, this, this parent bird delivering the food ball and it gets its beak right down the throat of the nestling. 
and they've got this huge gape and a big stomach and they grow just so that the food is what it's all about as a nestling. And here they are, 41 days later and 42 days later, transformed from that little bald nestling to these beautiful birds with their incredibly long feathers. And this one you see here on the right is doing some exercises. It's stretching and they do press ups to get their muscles toned because once they go through that hole, that's it. They've got to fly. The other thing you can see here is the young birds have more white on their faces and they have a little bit of white scalloping around the dark feathers on their heads. So if you ever do find a swift in, in the summer on the ground, you can, you can often tell whether it is a young bird or an, or an adult bird by the amount of white on its head. And here we are, swifts looking out through a ventilation brick just before fledging. Um, and they do this, they'll look out and it's a scary moment for a swift. It, they look out and they think maybe not quite ready now and then they'll retreat to the back of the nest and maybe for a day or two and then they'll come back and eventually they just instinct takes over and they're off and once they're off they're straight down they, they don't hang about nobody shows them the way they're straight off to Af Africa pretty well immediately and the pair of birds come back and they're but they're young they might not all leave at once but when the last one's gone, the parent birds come back and it's quite a confusing time for them as it would be for us. So this is the grim bit. Swift numbers are declining in the UK pretty steeply and they reckon that the numbers are going down 5% every year. So we've got to do something about this. There are two main problems. One of them is insect decline. And this can happen, um, well, this is obviously a global problem and it's partly due to climate change. It's due to how we manage our land, farming techniques, pesticides. Um, but it is a cause of a lot of insectivorous birds being in decline. But the other one is nest boxes, uh, loss of nest sites. So what is happening is that through building renovation, a lot of holes are getting blocked off and our homes are becoming sealed against nature. And so when the swift comes back from Africa, it may come because they're very sight faithful and it comes back to its hole or where it thinks its hole is, the nest site that it's claimed the previous year and the access may, might be blocked and in that case they just keep trying and trying for days to access that hole and in the end they'll probably just give up altogether and that means they won't breed that year. So trying to save original swift nest sites is really important but the scale of the problem is massive and there are a lot of people out there working hard to try and improve the loss of the swift and here are some of them. So here's the legendary Edward Mayer who gave your most popular talk ever. Um, Ed, Edward runs swift conservation and works really all over the world um, talking to architects, developers, anyone will listen and he's got a lot of swift projects up and running and here we have two in Spain we have Elena and Gloria um, Portillo and Elena lives in Seville Sevilla and she, she she also she's running swift projects and she looks after injured birds as well and she's really really passionate about swifts and her mother as well and here we have Martine, the swift lady from Belgium. You can tell what she's doing. And three guys in Northern, Northern Ireland who I met when I was researching my book. Northern Ireland, they're really good. They're really hot on their swift conservation. And here they are with some cabinet swift boxes. 
this guy here, Brian Callahan, he's got dozens of swift boxes on his house and house and he's got nesting house martins i think 12 pairs he's got any number of swifts and he has swallows in his shed in the garden and it's phenomenal how many he's got they do have very good insect um opportunity resources nearby because the the loch the the lochs of northern ireland have lots of good midges in them non-biting midges which the swifts will eat up so the, the things work well there that with brian's house and all these boxes excellent opportunities for nesting and the food supply too this guy is mauro mauro ferry in italy and behind him is um, an old fortified tower and these once they stopped needing them as as defensive towers people started converting them into swift towers and putting little holes in them and what they do it became a bit of a status symbol actually and people people love to have a, a swift tower and then they harvest a certain proportion of the chicks each year when they when the nestlings were not far off fledging and they would cook them and turn them into little puddings Sounds gross, but Mauro tells me that we were just as bad because we used to do the same thing with sparrows. Anyway, these towers now are wonderful. The problem is a lot of them have um, fallen away or been over restored and the holes blocked up. So Mauro has been on a mission to try and restore as many towers as well, to try and persuade people to restore their towers for Swift. This one in um, one of the national parks is one that he took on personally and it now has a, a a very good population of swifts again it had been taken over by starlings and starlings were eating all the cherries in the local area so when mara took on the swift ta swift tower and dedicated it to swifts people were really pleased because that meant the starlings wouldn't eat so many cherries or there wouldn't be so many starlings to eat cherries so another um possible solution that's been explored is swift towers um, these were sort of hailed as a bit of a panacea for all the ills but in fact they've not been brilliantly successful swifts don't seem to like nesting quite that they love to nest in loose colonies but not right cheek by jowl and um, this was a very expensive one in Cambridge this was a much cheaper one sort of handmade homemade Dick Newell here who made it um, and I, th I think they both have had a couple of um, nesting pairs in them but generally swifts do seem to prefer to nest in buildings than in these um, perhaps rather exposed structures so here we have um, this is a guy called Mark Glanville in Bristol. Some of you may have heard of him. He's, as you can see, he's got lots of boxes on his house and he does a lot of community work for Swift, raising awareness of Swifts as well. And he's got a very good website that tells you how to make Swift boxes and all the things you can do. This was a project in Hastings, I think. Um, there's a little group called Hastings and Rother Swifts and they they go out and put lots of nest boxes on buildings and they're also starting to put nest bricks in in where they can as well so here's a swift going into a nest box and this was what church towers can be very good place to put swift boxes behind the louvres um because obviously church people hate pigeons well a lot of people hate pigeons nobody wants the mess but if you put a box behind the louvres so the swift can only get into the box then you're not going to be letting pigeons in either so um, some of these may have been netted in the past but they make enough room so that the swift can get into the box and they're high up which is another real advantage to the swift now bricks bricks are really where things should be going because the beauty of a brick is that it's integral to the building and it'll last for the duration of the building so these are special bricks with a space behind, which are ideal for Swifts. Um, and also, amazingly, this was one in a development by the Duchy of Cornwall, um, Nansledden near Newquay. 
um, and they, the duchy has been amazing. They have led the way in terms of putting swift bricks in every single building that they are developing. So eat, uh, there's a ratio of one per house, um, which is exactly what we need. And this one, as you can see, is being used by House Martin, which is a little unexpected, but they've absolutely taken to them. I think they had quite a few pairs moved into these bricks, along with sparrows, blue tits, great tits, um, hibernating tortoiseshell butterflies, all sorts of wildlife really makes use of these bricks. And I think people have realised now that the swift brick is actually an ideal thing for all cavity nesting small wildlife. Um, so there's a, move, there's a move ahead to try and get builders to incorporate these um, rather than things like house sparrow terraces, which they have been putting in, which sparrow, again, sparrow's not so keen really on being too close together, um, like swift thing, like to nest colonially, but not on top of each other. So um, here, these are just a few things that you can do. Um, we have a happy couple with their swift box, very pleased that that's about to go up on their house. And just gardening for wildlife, that's the other thing that we should, that we can and probably all of you are doing already, is just to garden in an insect friendly, wildlife friendly way um, and campaign for the global nature 30 by 30 nature plan that's the other thing we can do and that swift is carved into one of the pillars in the natural history museum and that's that's me great well thank you very much for that talk and i think it's raised quite a few questions as well ashley which we'll address in a second um what is the uh, what is the future for the Swift in the UK? How's it looking? That depends on us, really. Um, it's been estimated that we need to incorporate twenty thousand nest bricks into new housing each year for the next twenty years to catch up on the nesting holes that are being lost. Um, that, there are signs that that is starting to be a growing trend, um, certainly in the West Country of England, it's happening, and there are a few isolated cases, isolated instances where developers have incorporated swift brick, but it's really only just starting to begin in a lot of parts of the country. Um, uh, more people are putting up swift boxes. I heard today that in my area, Telford and Reeking Council are going to put them on all their council buildings. That was a lovely bit of news. Um, and then I bumped into someone else today who told me that they were going to put them up in Manchester. So I am starting to hear some better news, but we've got a hell of a long way to go. Yeah, I, I remember I used to uh, visit Walthamstow quite a lot years ago and um, I had a girlfriend in Walthamstow, <coughs> excuse me, and um, there was a house I noticed around the corner from where she lived where there was a massive gap in the in the rafter, or the, you know, the whatever it is, the roof. And um, there were swifts nesting every year, and I, I was rejoicing until one year I noticed that the house was up for sale. And I was petrified, thinking, oh no, the person that moves in here the first thing they're going to do is, oh, I need to do some repairs, there's holes here. And I wasn't obviously around, I didn't know when that person moved in. And I remember the next year coming along, in fact, during the winter, I looked and I saw where the hole had been blocked up. And it was just, it was just very heartbreaking yeah. to, to have seen that. Absolutely. What's, I mean, Swifts are pretty amazing creatures. We've got a few minutes before we actually end the first hour. I just want to. I mean, we've got a few questions as well. We, we can address the questions afterwards. But swifts are quite amazing. I know that in your book you've talked about several other types of swifts. In fact, all of, did you talk about all the swifts? Well, I did a brief. I I as I as I mentioned earlier, I'm not really a proper birder. I just got really interested in this one particular subject. But what I did is I 
I wanted to explore, I wanted to find out about the Swifts of the world. Um, and I borrowed a huge handbook to the birds of the world and, and read that and various other Swift books as well to find out more. Um, and yes, I mean, it, it is amazing. The, the, for, the, the ones that, um, a lot of them nest, a lot of them do nest in trees. Um, in the rainforests. Um, sorry, a cup of tea has just arrived. Thank you. You got good service there, I tell you. Very good service. <laughs> um, so, so, and, and there's, the, there's, there's one that nests on a twig, and and uh, yeah, all, all sort and all sorts of really wonderful adaptations that they have. Um, is, is there anything in particular you were thinking of, David? No, I mean... I, yeah, I know I've... you know far more about than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, but I, I haven't written a book about them. But um, no, I mean, I, I find... Because I know that there's quite a few species and I know that there's questions over some of them. Like, for example, even the common swift, you know, the further east you go, you've got the swift that hangs out around in... Beijing and all that area yeah. because we had someone come on um, uh, and to speak about Beijing, birding in Beijing. Yeah. Um, and he was talking about the Beijing Swift and how yes. it, its migration it's was slightly sort of, different. It's a subspecies of Apis apus, isn't it? Yeah. Pecanensis. That's right. Yeah. Um, and the fact that they're quite similar looking, I guess, to uh, to um, Pallid swifts, and then yeah. it's all very confusing in terms of what's it what. Is. The the number of times birds are moved from one family to another, um, it, um, it is quite confusing. The whole subject of taxonomy is is very complex. It certainly yeah, is. It should be said about the um, the the fastest swift in the world. Um, which I'm going to check my notes for this because otherwise I'm very bad with figures. I always double them, so I better not do that. Is it um, the needle tail swift? The needle tail swift, yes, and that that flies even for our swift. The common swift has been recorded flying at sixty nine point three miles an hour, and the I think it's the white throated needle tail is oh, something like a hundred miles an hour. It's even faster. But apparently that's not been officially corroborated, but it's very, very fast. I mean, I've heard that that swift, the white-throated um, needle tail, may even challenge the peregrine in terms really? of its flight. In fact, it is, I suppose, when you look at that figure you've just given us, it's probably the fastest bird in the world in, in you know, in powered flight because it's flying horizontally, it's not stooping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because in, in powered flight, a pigeon can now fly a, a peregrine. <laughs> so you know it's it's interesting what you gauge yeah. as being the fastest yeah. in the world you should be comparing like with like really shouldn't you exactly exactly yeah. but nothing's like that in life is it really no. um but one of the ones i've always really think, found fascinating is the forbes watson swift oh yeah I know, I know nothing about it other than it's very hard to see and you know how many, no one knows how many there are and all that sort of stuff um, and it looks very similar to a common swift. But in my life, I've seen quite a few swift species. I mean, I'm very keen on seeing these swifts when I'm anywhere in the world. And I find some of them very difficult to actually identify. In North America, and there's a few people here from North America tonight, maybe we can talk to them afterwards about this, but there are a few. There's the, um, you know, the chimney swift, and then there's the Vos swift. Yeah which um, recently, and when I say recently, maybe the last 20 years, was found breeding in the center of downtown Los Angeles, um, which was like a big <gasps> moment because wow. they were normally yeah. sort of forth nesting in cliffs or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then there's a white-throated swift and a black swift, you know, so it's quite... And swift that nest behind waterfalls as well. Yeah, that's, that's further, I think yeah, that's further. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. It's, they're an incredible family. Yeah. But the question for you is, what is your favourite bird? Oh, well, I better say a swift, don't you think? <laughs> but I do love so many birds. Um, I really do love the swifts. And the more you, the more you tune into a bird, 
And the more you get to know it, then you love them that much more. But I have to say that I do, I also love the house martins that I've lived with on and off throughout my life. And um, the robins that come into my garden, the dunnock, I, I, I just, I, there isn't a bird that I don't love. Did you know that the house martin is one of the very few birds in Britain and certainly in Europe that has feathered toes? I did to keep them warm because they they fly even higher than a swift sometimes I think it's, yeah yeah feathered toes amazing. Absolutely and if you could be anywhere in this world notwithstanding the current pandemic where would you be right now? Oh, such a difficult question to answer um, but for some reason I'm saying Romania um, because I love that country. I've, I've been there a few times, um, nothing to do with Swifts, um, but I've ex explored that country a bit and I love it's the fact that it's still not quite jumped into the 21st century yet. You still find a lot of really beautiful wild areas and meadows and old fashioned agriculture. So off the top of my head, I'm saying Romania, but there's lots of other places I'd like to be as well, not least Extremadura. <laughs> okay, uh, Zoomers, uh, just to round up what's happening in the near future, um, on Monday the 10th of May, we've got Catherine Norbury, who will be talking about her book, Women in Nature, which is all about, um, well, I suppose it's extractions of, of work from women across the centuries talking about nature. Um, on Thursday, the 27th of May, we've got James Lowen, who's based in Norfolk, talking about moths. Um, he's a keen mother. And on in May, Monday, the 31st of May, we've got Les Stroud, who may be well known to people in North America, but not necessarily this side of the, of the pond. But he's a survivalist. And he's going to be talking about surviving in nature. So that's going to be an interesting conversation. Um, on June the 7th, Monday, June the 7th, we've got Charlie Corbett, who's written a book called 12 Birds to Save, to save Your Life. So I think if you want to save your life, you better come and watch that one. And uh, on Monday, the 28th of June, we've got a guy called Joe Shute. And he's a journalist um, interested in natural history and has written a book about the weather. And he's going to be talking about what we know about the weather. And on top of that, we've got a few more people coming, including a good friend of mine, a guy called Johan Jensen, who is um, an ornithologist based in Belgium. But every year he goes to Georgia, and that's not America, that's over by Russia, uh, to a place called Batumi to count uh, the raptors flying overhead there. And apparently there's like a million birds of prey that pass over every autumn. So that would be an interesting chat in terms of what work he's been doing. So um, I guess we've come to the point where I have to say goodbye to you, Sarah, and thank you for coming along to talk about Swifts. And also, uh, if you get her book, you can find out I have a lot more. So Sarah, thank you very much. Thank you, David, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, and Zoomers as ever, it's great to, to have you around. Thank you very much for showing up today. Appreciate it, hope you enjoyed it. Um, look after yourselves and keep looking up for those Swifts. <laughs>